There is nothing more tantalizing to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies, and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. CIA Chief's team member reports Havana Syndrome In early September of this year, a member of CIA Director Bill Burns' staff made national and global news when they reportedly became afflicted with the mysterious symptoms known as Havana Syndrome after a government-sanctioned trip to India. The fact that the case involved such a high-level government official renewed interest in the often strange and mind-boggling illness that appears to affect only government officials and diplomats visiting other countries. Havana Syndrome is a strange illness that has been observed in diplomats and political figures starting in 2016 with US Embassy diplomats in Havana, Cuba. The symptoms are often unexplained and associated with dizziness, headache, fatigue, nausea, anxiety, cognitive difficulties, and memory loss. These symptoms can vary widely in severity, and several diplomats and intelligence officers who have been diagnosed with the syndrome have had to leave active service due to the nature of their condition and lingering complications. Although originating in Cuba, the symptoms have been reported in China, Russia, Germany, Serbia, India, Poland, Georgia, and Taiwan. Because Havana syndrome has only been reported in diplomats, intelligence officers, and other government personnel, Many people theorize that they may be targeted attacks against the government, and the CIA has placed top personnel in charge of investigating the circumstances. Burns has stated that, as of July 22, 2021, there were several hundred total reported instances of Havana Syndrome globally. Thus far, the official cause of Havana Syndrome has not been able to be determined, although it is not for lack of trying. It appears that the disease is causing brain damage of some sort in the individuals, and although initial reports suggested that it might have been caused by a sonic or acoustic weapon, now the predominant theory is that a strongly directed energy, such as microwaves, might be to blame. This conclusion was reached by a task force directed by the State Department and the National Academics of Science, Engineering and Medicine, and similar studies by other entities have supported these findings. Directed energy as a weapon is not unheard of, and many think that the attacks might have been intentionally targeted to cause harm, while others believe that the damage could have been an inadvertent result of high-powered microwaves aimed at high-ranking US officials in an attempt to collect data from their computers and mobile phones. However, nobody has been able to link the symptoms of Havana syndrome with any country or definitive cause, and the countries in which government officials have fallen ill have denied any involvement. And, while it has yet to be determined what exactly the illness stems from, the CIA director's staff member is not the first to experience these strange symptoms, although he is a chilling reminder to government officials that not even those associated with the highest inner circles of the government are truly safe. Two members of former President Donald Trump's staff were suddenly struck with the illness near entrance points to the White House, putting officials on edge about the safety of any government buildings, both on home soil and abroad. For now, officials remain on alert as they try to get to the root of what might be causing such a strange illness that only seems to affect diplomats and intelligence officials of the United States and Canada. Man claims to have escaped from Alcatraz Most people know of an escape attempt from Alcatraz. The subject of one of cinema's most famous movies, the 1962 escape has been shrouded in mystery from the get-go. The three men involved, John Anglin, Clarence Anglin and Frank Morris, were inmates at the penitentiary for their involvement in a bank robbery. Through their ingenuity, the trio showed the world that the high-security prison was not escape-proof after all. Supposedly, the men dug a small tunnel out of their cells using sharpened spoons as their only tools. The effort took months to complete, and the men crafted a raft out of their raincoats and set off on the choppy San Francisco waters in the middle of the night. Despite their escape, 
the men were never seen again, leaving many to wonder if any of the escapees made it across safely. For decades, people have argued for and against the survival of the three criminals, with many believing that the swim across the bay would have been impossible for the three men to complete, yet people do swim the journey today. However, in 2018, an interesting development came to light thanks to the San Francisco Police Department. In 2013, the San Francisco television station KPIX received a letter from an unknown sender, claiming to be from the prisoner John Anglin. The now public letter is an incredibly interesting read, as it includes some closure on the famous mystery, if it is to be believed. It begins with, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. The letter goes on to explain what happened to the other two inmates. According to the letter, the other Anglin brother, Clarence, passed away in 2008, while Frank Morris passed away in 2005, supporting the idea that the trio lived on into old age. That said, the letter is not all positive. John Anglin goes on to state that he has cancer and also tries to bargain with the police in exchange for medical care, stating that, If you announce on TV that I will be promised to just go to jail for no more than a year and get medical attention, I will write back to let you know exactly where I am. While somewhat bone-chilling, the letter's authenticity has obviously come into question. It took the police five years to make the existence of the letter known to the public, and it was sent to the FBI for analysis on authenticity. Interestingly, in comparisons between the handwriting of the three inmates to that of the submitted letter, the results were inconclusive, according to the US Marshals. Relatives of the Anglin brothers stated that they would find roses supposedly left by John and Clarence for years after their escape, including their signatures. So, what could it be? Is this letter just some prankster with too much time, or could it be the last contact made by one of the United States' most wanted men? The Library of Alexandria The Library of Alexandria in northern Egypt was the largest library in the ancient world. The library housed works from all of the great minds of the time. These included works from Homer, Plato and Socrates. The city of Alexandria was founded by Alexander the Great sometime around 330 BC. Alexandria was once only a small fishing village, but it eventually rose to great prowess. It became the seat of the government, as well as a city known for its intellect and culture. It is widely touted as the greatest city of the ancient world. Ptolemy I Sotir, Alexander's successor, now pharaoh, is believed to have founded the library in 295 BC. Some believe scholar Demetrius of Phalium convinced him to do so. The dream was to house every book in the world inside of its walls. Starting as somewhat of a museum, as it also housed laboratories, botanical gardens, and even a zoo, the library did not come to its status as a universal public library until the reign of Ptolemy II. At this time, the library housed 100 full-time scholars whose job it was to solely carry out research. They would also translate, publish, and lecture on the works contained in the library. At one time, the library may have housed as many as 500,000 documents, some argue on whether this was full of books or merely the amount of scrolls contained inside. Either way, the number was impressive. Some doubt this number, as the building to house such a collection would have been massive. What happened to the Library of Alexandria has been widely disputed since its fall. The greatest catastrophe of the ancient world has always been attributed to fire. Just how big of an event this was, however, has always been questioned. Perhaps the most believed theory is that Julius Caesar is responsible for the fire. During Caesar's occupation of Alexandria in 48 BC, he ordered fire to be set to the Egyptian ships in the harbour. The fire quickly spread, overtaking the warehouses and other buildings in the port before spreading to the library. Though Caesar admitted to the burning of the ships, he never took the blame for the burning of the city. Another theory ties the burning to the Muslim caliph Omar. In 640 AD, when Muslims took occupancy of Alexandria, the library was of great interest. Omar was thought to believe either the whole library either contradicted the Quran or agreed with it, and either way, it was unneeded. 
It is said Omar then used the texts as fire starters around the city. Accounts claim it took six whole months to burn all of the documents. None of this was even documented until 300 years after it happened. It may have been hearsay, it may have been words written by Christians condemning Muslims, it may never actually be uncovered. As you can see, Alexandria was always a volatile city. It is hard to pinpoint precisely one incident that destroyed the library. Perhaps the greatest mystery of this lost library is the fact that there are no ruins, no scrolls that can be attributed to its collection. Archaeologists hope all of this evidence is housed beneath the bustling metropolis of modern-day Alexandria and can someday be unearthed. The Mantell UFO Incident Captain Thomas Mantell was an experienced pilot, boasting a flight history of 2,167 hours in the air. Many of these hours had been served during World War II, where he fought for the Allies in the Battle of Normandy and was rewarded with the Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Medal for his heroism. In 1947, he returned to Louisville and joined the new Kentucky Air National Guard as a flight leader. However, less than a year into the new job, Mantell's career ended in tragedy when he died in pursuit of an unknown flying object. The object was seen by several of Mantell's colleagues. Base Commander Colonel Guy Hicks reported it was very white and about one-fourth the size of the full moon, while observers at Clinton County Army Airfield in Ohio described it as having the appearance of a flaming red cone trailing a gaseous green mist, with a speed greater than 500 miles per hour in level flight. It was also seen by the Kentucky State Police, who contacted Captain Mantell requesting for him to investigate the object. Alongside two colleagues, Mantell set off in pursuit of the large white object. When his colleagues informed him they were going to retreat and level their altitude to try and see the object more clearly, Mantell ignored them, pursuing the object in a steep climb and at a high altitude. Unfortunately, while at this altitude, Mantell blacked out from a lack of oxygen and he and his plane crashed at a farm south of Franklin on the Tennessee-Kentucky state line. Mantell died on impact. Mantell's death was tragic, but also a monumental occasion in UFO history. Before this point, there had been only a few cases reporting unidentified flying objects, and most of these cases had been dismissed by the public as fads or the delusional sightings of insane men and women. However, Mantell was a highly respected pilot, and the fact he had laid down his own life to determine what the object was resulted in an increased public concern about UFO phenomena. The official response from the Air Force line where Mantell worked was that the object he had seen was actually Venus. However, this theory has been attacked by others who argue that on the date of Mantell's death, Venus was only 33 degrees above the horizon and thus would not have been visible to Mantell. An official investigation was later opened, named Project Blue Book, that concluded that the object Mantell had been chasing was a skyhook balloon and part of a top-secret project that neither Mantell nor his colleagues would have known about. These skyhook balloons were being used by the Navy to measure radiation levels in the upper atmosphere. The skyhook balloon finding has largely been accepted, however, there are still some skeptics. For example, eyewitness Glenn Mays insists that Mantell was the victim of an attack as he swears he saw Mantell's plane explode in mid-air as if the result of a bullet. His argument is supported by James Doosler who states that the damage pattern on Mantell's plane was not consistent with an aircraft crashing at high speed, but instead one that belly flopped into the clearing, as if it was shot down. There are even some who say that when Mantell's body was found, it was riddled with strange holes, which might have been bullet holes. Whether you accept the official line that Mantell was chasing after a skyhook balloon, or believe he was the victim of a weapon, what Mantell was chasing that day remains ambiguous. The Cando Event Cando is a small village in the northwest of Spain with a population of just over 1,000 people. The village has few distinguishing characteristics that would separate it from most Spanish villages. However, events on January 18, 1994 brought Cando to the public spotlight. On that evening, witnesses claimed to see a fireball in the sky that lasted for almost one minute. The fireball was said to be the size of a full moon and led many to assume it was some kind of meteor. 
The situation grew even stranger when subsequently a large explosion crater was discovered nearby. This crater was discovered in a hillside close to the village and had uprooted all trees in a 100 meter diameter and displaced up to 200 meters of terrain. However, what was never found was any trace of meteorites or any other object that could have caused this damage. Many were startled at how similar the scene looked to a Tunguskan explosion in 1908 that flattened around 80 million trees and killed three people. Like the Kando event, the most popular explanation for the events were that there must have been some type of meteoroid, but once again no remnant of a meteor was discovered. Many believed that the meteor in Tunguska disintegrated in the altitude before it ever hit Earth. A similar explanation has been put forward for the Kando incident, but has not been as widely accepted. Hopes were raised further when an official investigation from the Astronomy Department of the University of Santiago de Compostela was opened for the events in Kando. Their findings were published in the Journal of Meteoritics and Planetary Science in 1998 and went against the meteorite explanation. The team concluded that the incident might have been caused by a blast of subterranean gases, which removed the topsoil when it suddenly exploded and soared into the air. When it rose into the air, an electric charge would have been created that would have been sufficient to ignite the gases and created the fireball-like scene that witnesses had described. However, this has not stopped other theorists arguing that the Kando event was the result of a military operation or alien activities. The Strange Harry Turner Incident Harry Turner, a long-haul truck driver, was traveling from Winchester to Fredericksburg, Virginia in September of 1979. While driving one night, Harry saw a bright light coming towards him. At first, he assumed it was headlights from another truck, but his whole truck was suddenly surrounded by the light. Harry couldn't control the steering wheel, and the truck now seemed to be floating. Before he could try to do anything else, the truck door was opened by something invisible. He felt something holding onto him, but it was too strong to fight. He pulled out his gun and fired all eight rounds. Whatever was holding him down finally let go. After that, he blacked out and has no memory of what happened next. He woke up in a warehouse parking lot in Fredericksburg, nowhere near where he last remembered being. He was still holding his gun and the empty shells were all around the truck. Although his watch said it was 11.17 p.m., the warehouse clock said it was 3 a.m. He checked his odometer, which showed that he had only driven 17 miles. However, he knew the trip should have been around 80 miles. Harry's memory of the rest of that night came back slowly. Eventually, he remembered being taken to some sort of aircraft. He saw strange creatures who were all dressed in white and all had numbers on their heads. He inexplicably had new knowledge of a star system called Alpha Centauri. Many other people have gained knowledge of this same star system after claiming to be abducted as well. After that night, Harry had several more unexplainable experiences. One day he was approached by six of the same creatures who had taken him that night, but he was unable to fight them off and get away. Another time he claimed that he was suddenly soaking wet, but there was no reason for it. Animals began acting strangely when he got around them, and there was no reasonable explanation for it. One night, while staring at the ceiling in bed, he suddenly realized he could actually see through the ceiling. On another night, he looked over at his wife while she was sleeping, and he could see through her skin. He knew this had to be caused by his abduction. On one occasion, one of the creatures suddenly appeared beside him in his car while he was driving. It scared him so much that he started driving fast enough to be chased by several police cars. He was charged for reckless driving and failing to stop. He explained what happened, but the creature had already disappeared. Harry tried his best to piece all his memories together of that September night, hoping the truth would help him feel more at ease, but he was never successful. He became more and more withdrawn and often had bad thoughts. He knew he would never know what truly happened. The Mann Family On June 19, 1978, John and Gloria Mann were driving from Reading, Berkshire to Brockworth, Gloucestershire with their two children, Natasha and Tanya, and John's sister, Frances. They left around 9.30 that night, and they knew they should have been home by 11 since they had made the trip before. 
Around 10, they noticed a white light. They knew it wasn't coming from the moon and it couldn't have been a star. They pulled over and John got out to see if they could hear anything unusual. A red light came on beside the white one and it moved towards them quickly. They heard a loud noise as the lights moved, almost like a train. They drove away, but they soon realized they were no longer on the same road as before. John recalled later that he got the feeling that if he had let go of the wheel, the car would have been able to drive by itself. Suddenly, they were in Farringdon, Gloucestershire, but they never remembered seeing the welcome sign like they normally did. They noticed the light behind them again, but it didn't seem to be trying to catch them. It maintained its distance and seemed to disappear whenever they passed by houses. The light had vanished completely by the time they got home. They realized it was now after midnight, although it should have only been 11 p.m. Francis went home, the children were put to bed, then John called the Air Force Station to report the UFO. The next day, John tried to find the place where they first saw the light or road they ended up on the night before while driving away from it, but he couldn't find it anywhere. He wondered if they had somehow all been hallucinating, but then he noticed a rash on his chest. After showing his wife, she said she had a similar rash on her arm and leg. He called Francis and found out she had a rash as well. They also had bruises below their right knees, but they didn't know why. Their daughter, Natasha, had disturbing dreams for weeks after the incident. In her dreams, she saw people with strange-looking eyes staring at her. She said someone had taken her parents into a different room. When Gloria tried to learn more about the dreams, Natasha told her that she should already know since she was there. This convinced them that they hadn't been hallucinating after all, and John and Francis went to a hypnotherapist for help. John remembered more of that night once he was under hypnosis. After he left the car, a UFO landed in front of them. Eight creatures wearing silver suits and helmets appeared and got the women and children from the car. A column of light lifted them all off the ground, and they came to a room with several more creatures. They took John to a separate room where he sat in a chair and a bright light was put in front of him. He remembered the creatures examining him, but then he blacked out. When he woke up, he saw three of the creatures talking, but they were speaking in an unfamiliar language. One named Anuxia began to speak to him in English and told him they wouldn't harm him or his family. John and Francis both recall watching a film that showed them how the creature's planet had been destroyed by meteors. They were hoping to be able to live on Earth in exchange for their technology. They were both given a drink before leaving the ship that would help them forget what happened. The Hopkinsville Goblin Back on the 21st of August in the year 1955, there was an impossible to explain incident that led to many believing that perhaps some strange extraterrestrial beings, later given the name of the Hopskinville Goblins, had made contact with human beings only to demonstrate a malevolent behavior. According to the police report surrounding the incident, the Hopkinsville Police Department reported that five adults and seven children entered the police station obviously distraught and in a panic. They reported to the police department that they had been in a gunfight lasting for more than four hours after small alien creatures had come out of a spaceship and began to attack them at their farmhouse. According to two witnesses of the events, they claimed that there had been somewhere between 12 and 15 short humanoid figures that had repeatedly popped up at the doorway and peered in through the windows that forced the family to open fire to keep the creatures from entering the home. As they would shoot the creatures, they claimed they would fall to the floor momentarily, only to roll away and get back up and resume trying to enter the home. Others gave descriptions of the creatures that they believed were extraterrestrial beings, standing at roughly two to four feet tall and had large pointed ears, claws for hands and large eyes that glowed yellow. This led to the police department sending four city police, three deputy sheriffs and four military police to the farmhouse to conduct an investigation on the matter leading to them finding evidence of the gunfights, bullet holes and clawed attempts to enter the home against the doors and windowsills. A few hours later, the family would pack up and leave the farmhouse entirely after reports claimed the creatures had returned at around 3.30am and tried to resume the gunfight once more. Nothing more was ever understood from the event following this incident. The Clapham Wood Mystery Clapham Wood is a wooded area located in West Sussex, England. 
The woods are not far from the small town of Clapham. Clapham is one of those towns you tell stories about. The small village that seems to have always been there was always the focus point of various stories. Being slightly shrouded from the public, there was always an air of mystery about it. Soon enough, people from the area began reporting strange goings on there. Since the 1960s, UFOs have been prevalent in the skies above the woods and Clapham itself. There have been hundreds of sightings reported. Along with the sightings, people have complained of nausea and the feeling of being followed. There have also been reports of a strange grey mist hovering over the ground. People have been saying they've been pushed along pathways for years. Studies of the area show a slightly elevated level of radiation. However, the numbers are varied and are difficult to track. UFOs aside, Clapham Woods are a mystery for another reason. A strange string of events started in April of 1972. It was then when the body of a young woman was found in Clapham Woods. Police Constable Peter Goldsmith was assigned to the case. By June, Goldsmith himself had disappeared into the woods. It wasn't until six months later his body was found less than half a mile from where the girl was originally found. His cause of death was never identified. In 1975, residents began falling ill, and maybe even stranger, their pets started to go missing. On two occasions, only a week apart, two different men's dogs ran off into the woods and were never seen again. A third dog was found after he had run off into the woods but was paralysed. No cause was ever found and the dog was eventually put down. In July of 1975, Leon Foster disappeared only to be found later in the woods. He was found by a couple searching for their horse, who had also gone missing. On Halloween 1978, a retired reverend disappeared and in 1981, a homeless woman was found in the forest. The cause of the mysterious happening of the woods went unsolved for many years. That was until a paranormal investigator known as Charles Walker began asking questions. He claims to have received an anonymous phone call from a well-spoken man. This man offered to meet Walker at the crossroads deep in the Clapham Woods. Walker obliged and went to meet his anonymous caller. When he arrived, however, there was no one there. A voice called from the nearby brush. However, he did not wish to be identified, claiming it would be bad for both of them. He identified himself as a cult initiate of the Friends of Hecate, a satanic cult. The cult had been using the woods for their meetings, which often included sacrifices, which could explain away the missing animals. The initiate, however, did not mention any of the people who had wound up dead in the woods. The man did issue a warning. There are people in high places involved, holding positions of power and authority, who will tolerate no interference. We will stop at nothing to ensure the safety of our cult. Many believed the Friends of Hecate inhabited the woods until 1987 when the woods were damaged by a storm. UFOs, satanic cults, strange mists, whatever the cause, Clapham Woods is definitely a wood shrouded in mystery. Christopher Columbus Bermuda Triangle UFO The mysterious happenings at the Bermuda Triangle area are not a recent phenomenon. When Christopher Columbus made the historic journey to North America, he experienced some very strange events in the Atlantic Ocean, especially in the Bermuda Triangle. Christopher Columbus reported about the compass pointing in the wrong direction while passing through the Bermuda Triangle. He also reported mysterious waves rising without any wind. However, the most shocking thing that Columbus and his men witnessed was an unexplained light rising from the ocean and levitating on the horizon. The unexplained UFO baffled Christopher Columbus. The light seemed to be moving across the horizon at a slow pace. Then suddenly, it rose up and disappeared into the sky. At first, Columbus thought that the light was coming from land and that they had finally made it to their destination. However, after a while, he realized that this faint light that seemed like a small wax candle was moving and rising. There have been a number of theories about the mysterious UFO lights seen by Columbus and his men over the Bermuda Triangle. Some historians believe that it was most likely that Columbus and his crew saw a meteor. Some people believe that it was the phenomenon of bioluminescence and the light was glowing due to bacterial activity. Another theory suggests that Columbus and his men were very close to land and the light was actually coming from land. However, 
None of these theories explains the mysterious candle wax type appearance or the strange upward movement of the light as described by Columbus. Ghost Ships On the 31st of January 1921, a five-masted commercial schooner named Carol A. Deering was found wrecked at Hatteras Diamond Shoals in North Carolina. It seemed that the ship's crew had abandoned it without leaving any message for their loved ones. Not only the crew was missing, all their personal belongings and ship's equipment were also missing. This ship is often referred to as the Ghost Ship of the Outer Banks. Similar incidents were reported during the subsequent years. Ships were found deserted in the Bermuda Triangle and its surrounding areas. Often these ships were found to be floating for days without their crew. All the search and rescue missions sent to find the crew were unsuccessful. To this day, no one knows what happened to the crew of Carol A. Deering and other abandoned ships in the Bermuda Triangle. There are a number of theories about these ghost ships and their missing crews. Some people have claimed that the ships were attacked by pirates and crew members were killed. However, no evidence of any pirate activity could be found in the Bermuda Triangle during that time period. There are a number of other theories as well, but none of the theories are supported by any evidence, and the mystery of the ghost ships of the Bermuda Triangle continue to baffle the historians. USS Cyclops USS Cyclops was the biggest ship in the US Navy when it mysteriously disappeared without a trace. This massive ship was about 550 feet in length and it had a crew of 306 people. The ship started sailing in 1910 and initially it was used for commercial activities. Later, it was used for transporting troops and cargo during the First World War. In March 1918, USS Cyclops was returning from Brazil when the unexpected happened. The ship mysteriously disappeared without any clue of where it went. The last message received from the USS Cyclops simply said, Weather fair, all well. This means that the weather is good and everything is going well. Usually, after a ship sinks into the ocean due to an accident or for any other reason, some debris from the ship usually keeps floating on the surface of water for days and rescuers are able to identify the location of the ship's disappearance. Or sometimes people are even able to stay afloat using lifeboats and life jackets. However, in the USS Cyclops' mysterious disappearance, there were no floating pieces or men found floating on the surface of the water. More than 100 years have passed and still not a single piece of evidence has been found that could explain the mysterious disappearance of the USS Cyclops in the Bermuda Triangle. In an official statement, the US Navy admitted that the disappearance of the USS Cyclops is amongst the most baffling mysteries in the Navy's history, and all attempts made to locate the ship proved to be unsuccessful. The Disappearance of Renee McRae The disappearance of Renee McRae and her three-year-old son Andrew in 1976 is Britain's longest-running missing persons case. On Friday the 12th of November 1976, Renee had dropped her eldest son at her estranged husband's house and had then driven towards Kilmarnock, apparently to visit her sister. After turning onto the A9 highway, she was never to be seen again. That night, 12 miles from her last known sighting, McRae's BMW car was found on fire, empty. Police initiated an intensive search operation for McRae and her son but failed to find any significant trace of the pair. The only piece of notable evidence discovered was blood on a charred rug in the BMW, matching the DNA of Renee McRae. Some witnesses alleged that they had seen a man dragging a sheepskin object near the car, with others saying that they had seen a man pushing a pushchair by a nearby quarry. Coincidentally, McRae had been wearing a sheepskin coat that day. However, neither of these leads were thoroughly investigated. As the case unraveled, it became clear that McRae's personal life was more complicated than it appeared on the surface. McRae had been having an affair with a man named Bill McDowell, an employee of her husband Gordon McRae. The only person aware of the affair was Renee's best friend, Valerie Steventon. Steventon told the authorities that Renee had actually been heading to Perthshire to visit McDowell on the night of her disappearance. She also revealed another stunning revelation the turning point which added to the complex nature of the case. 
Bill McDowell was Andrew McRae's biological father. Investigators now had good reason to believe that McRae's presumed murderer was quite literally someone a little closer to home. Authorities began to believe that McRae and her son may have been murdered and buried under the A9 Road, which was undergoing construction work at the time. A farmer with supposed divining skills claimed that the bodies lay 12 feet underneath the road and marked this location with a yellow circle. Although Scottish police later announced that the bodies were not buried under the road, not everyone was convinced. A friend of an officer named Sandy Taylor claimed the officer had spoken to a foreman about a man digging up a section of the road on the day of the disappearance and had shown this man the evidence. The officer was instantly sure that this man knew far more than he was willing to tell. Suspiciously, the man fled to the US soon after. According to senior officials, Rene and Andrew McRae's case was mired in a sea of deceit and untruthfulness from its start. However, 2019 saw what may turn out to finally be closure for the McRae family, when Bill McDowell was charged with their murder and with attempting to deceive the course of justice. The Cape Intruder, Cape Elizabeth, Maine Hay Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and felt like someone was watching you? Well, if you lived in the town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine in 2005, that may very well have been the case. In this small town of only 9,000 people, residents felt like they knew their neighbours and it was not uncommon to leave their doors unlocked. That summer, residents of the small town that did not lock their doors at night reported that there would be a man in their room when they would wake up in the morning, staring at them as they slept. Every time, the man would flee the house before the victim would even react. They never reported any damages. No one was ever harmed, and there were never any tragic accidents. The man did, however, take any feeling of safety these people once felt in their homes. While they were never injured or robbed, it did not make the situation of a stranger looming over them as they woke any less terrifying. After the local news showed a rough sketch of a young man who appeared to be in his early 20s, the police received a ton of leads from people who thought they knew the man, but the police never did catch the Cape Intruder. The break-ins continued through the fall and into February of the following year before they just stopped. It is not known whether the intruder grew bored of the activity or simply moved on to another town. If there is one thing to take away from this story, it is to lock your doors. Jason Jolkowski's Disappearance June is the favourite season of many people. The midsummer is the perfect time to unwind. Jason Jolkowski was doing just that when he picked up the phone. Jason, 19 at the time, was called by his boss from the restaurant he worked at, asking if he could come in early. Jason was described as a hard-working man, but a hailstorm damaged his car and prohibited him from getting to work as he worked four miles away from his home. His boss organised for a co-worker to pick him up at the local school, but he never made it to meet with the co-worker. After 15 minutes of waiting for him to arrive, Jason's co-worker called their boss to inform him he was not there. She returned to work another 15 minutes later. Jason never came to work. Jason's family came home and found him still missing. The family searched for their son. Jason was a religious teenager and not the running away from home type, an honor student at his old school. He did, however, have a mild disability when it came to slurring and speech. He was in financial trouble and required jobs to keep afloat. Jim and Kelly, Jason's parents, were convinced that something disastrous must have happened. He never skipped work and was not with any of his friends either. The following morning, his family reported him as missing, but the police refused to help, telling the parents that the teen likely just went out with friends for the weekend and would surely return. The family and friends of Jason went looking for him, putting up posters and even having news of his disappearance run in the local radio station. By this point, the group of Jason's loved ones were certain he was hurt, if not fearing the worst. No news of his whereabouts ever turned up, but it forced the police into action, and although it was belated, they gave the investigation their all, but by then, it was too late to find worthwhile evidence. There was no evidence at all. He simply vanished. No clues to follow. 
Two weeks from his initial disappearance, the police got word of a boy with his description seen at the Mahoney State Park, but found nothing to prove he had been there. The family did everything in their power to find their son, with Kelly even beginning the organization Protect Jason to raise awareness. Now, 20 years later, his case continues to baffle investigators. Jason lacked funds to leave and begin a new life, nor was he the kind of man to do so. He also planned on working that day and his car was being repaired. Since he went missing, his bank account and social security number have remained untouched. His family refused to believe the theory that he took his life due to his religious faith and he was an upbeat individual who presented no sign of sorrow. They believe, to this day, that he was taken and someone had ended his life. Little is known about what became of him, with no body ever found. Disappearances are one of the hardest things families have to go through. Hope can be both a blessing and a curse. People disappear every single day, with cases sometimes forever remaining unsolved. Others can be solved decades afterwards, but the only certainty is uncertainty. Brandon Lawson In 2013, father of four Brandon Lawson went missing. His case captured the attention of the public and online speculation grew. For years, Brandon had been a dedicated family man with his four children and fiance Ladessa. The 26-year-old was an oil field worker, often working up to 95 hours a week. Despite the family-orientated attitude, he did have a criminal past. Brandon had a run-in with the law and a bench warrant due to his substance use. He spent time behind bars but had been using again in the run-up to his disappearance. Home from a long shift on August 9, 2013, Brandon and his fiancée had a row. Ladessa was angry at him not returning home and with his substance abuse, whilst Brandon is described as having been in panic mode. He quickly left, claiming he was driving to his father's three and a half hours away. Ladessa, concerned about his state of mind and unsure if he was high at the time, called and asked him to instead walk to his brother's, believing him to be unfit behind the wheel. We do not know if Brandon intended to follow his fiancée's advice or not. He did switch his route from Highway 277 to Highway 67, though he could have decided back roads would keep him out of the way of the police. Running low on gas, we know Brandon stopped to top up on his way. Ladessa remained concerned and called Brandon's brother, Kyle, seeking his help. Kyle and his girlfriend arrived at Brandon and Ladessa's home at approximately 12.10 a.m. Not long after Brandon had been on the road, he too tried to reach Kyle, telling him he needed gas brought to him, as he had gotten stuck on Highway 277. With broken service and speech slurred presumably due to substance abuse, it was tricky to make out Brandon's message though Kyle thinks Brandon told him he was 10 minutes up the road to hurry up and said that he was being chased out of town. Kyle's first impressions were that stimulants had resulted in paranoid hallucinations, though Brandon insisted he was not. Ladessa left a gas can by the front of the house for Kyle to take, then went to bed with her phone left charging elsewhere. She awoke to multiple unanswered calls from both men. When Kyle and his girlfriend found Brandon's truck, he was nowhere to be seen, and a police car was seen accompanying it. The police car followed a call made from an onlooker concerned about the truck being a hazard to other vehicles, though this is not the only 911 call that had been made that evening. Brandon himself called 911, requesting police in a manic and slurred call. He claimed people were chasing him into the woods, that he was bleeding, and some even believe there is another voice and firearm shots in the background. Recordings of the 911 call went viral and online strangers took to trying to decipher the message. No dispatcher was sent. Many believe his life was taken from him, with his claims to both Kyle and the police of him being chased, the reports of blood and his requests for the police, and the alleged second voice on the 911 call. However, investigators found no blood at the site. Some think he ran away, possibly avoiding the police for his substance abuse, trying to keep out of prison. However, he had already served time and was not afraid to be back behind bars. Some dismissed this theory as he would have been looking at a short sentence and was already working with an attorney, facing the felony charge. None of his friends nor family believe he could leave his children. 
Finally, why would a man running from the police call 911? Perhaps the most common speculation is that Brandon was high, hallucinating and paranoid, and that he hid to escape his hallucination and passed away in hiding. This seems to be the assumption Kyle holds. We may never know what happened to Brandon Lawson on that August night in 2013. Whilst it is truly devastating when it happens, there are millions of missing persons cases worldwide. Hopefully we find a concrete answer and hopefully it is positive news. The Disappearance of Laura Bradbury The final case we're going to talk about today is the heartbreaking disappearance of Laura Bradbury. Three-year-old Laura Bradbury, along with her two parents and older brother, were camping in the Joshua Tree National Park in 1984. It was on October 18th that Laura, along with her then eight-year-old brother Travis, went to the portable restrooms at the campground they were staying at. Travis left Laura outside whilst he used the restroom. By the time he had come out, Laura was gone. A search party of 250 people, with the assistance of helicopters and dogs, scoured the national park for Laura. After no breakthrough within three days, the police ended their search. Despite this, the Bradbury family showed no sign of stopping, handing out millions of flyers and even appearing on national TV to get the word out. They also set up a dedicated hotline for any information. A bearded man thought to be in his 50s, described as pot-bellied, with a blue van was seen around the area right before Laura disappeared, and then later near Burns Canyon. Michael, Laura's father, began to lose faith in the police and slammed them for not following up enough on tips coming through, telling reporters that the police were incompetent or lazy or both, and even went as far to suggest a cover-up. Michael then found out about Toby Santangelo and Clifford Laville and the fact that they supposedly told police information regarding the suspected kidnapper, but it was apparently investigated and deemed not credible. These two men were then found killed shortly after coming forward. Two years later, in 1986, a child's skull was found a couple of miles away from the campsite. However, it was never able to be proven it was Laura's. However, new tests were carried out on the skull in 1990, and they found the skull was a 99% match to Laura. Since 2009, Michael has been requesting the transfer of the skull found to a mortuary. But because there has yet to be a death certificate issued, the remains cannot be released. During an interview in 2010, Michael said that he was shown two completely different skulls during the investigation. A smaller partial skull shortly after the remains were found, and a larger full skull later on in the investigation. Also in a report on tests carried out, whilst the skull was a match in one DNA test, there were three other tests carried out including one using hair from Laura's hairbrush did not match the skull. What happened to Laura Bradbury remains a mystery to this day. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.